Okay, so um, I'm very pleased today to be joined by Andrea Thirian, who is the founder and CEO at Phipps Consulting. Thank you very much for joining me, Andrea. How are you? Thank you so much, Johnny. I'm doing great. Thanks. Excellent stuff. Now, today we are going to be discussing an interesting topic and a fairly wide topic, but we're going to try and zero in on some specific areas, and that is diversity and ESG in the services procurement supply chain. So we've got a lot to lot to cover, um, some key points we want to kind of hone in on. Um, you obviously have a wealth of supply chain and consulting experience. Would you just be able to give a, a bit of a background, a kind of potted history of your journey through the market to, to where you are now? Sure, thanks. Um, well, I've been uh, working in supply chain for um, a bit more than 10 years and uh I was leading a global uh, corporation's supplier diversity program for uh, six plus years. And that was for EMEA, so Europe, Middle East and Africa. That was for the first tier supplier diversity as well as the second tier supplier diversity program. And uh, during that time, since um, I was leading the program for IBM, which is um, one of the corporates who has a global established program, uh, a global supplier diversity team. I was uh, in a position where many corporates about, I think it was about 50 or more corporates who were reaching out to um, IBM to get input and help how to build and enhance their supplier diversity programs in non-US regions. And, uh, and that's how I realized, well, this is uh, something that is really needed. And I want to share my knowledge, not just with uh, within one corporation and go into um, deeper topics and help more corporations to build and enhance their programs in, in Europe or non-US uh, regions. Yeah, that's great. I really appreciate that. So, um, so looking at that, you've you've had a bit of a journey, and from the in-house perspective, you've obviously gained all this incredible experience within a very developed and a very mature and what sounds like quite a, a kind of market-leading type of program. Um, what differences are you seeing um, <coughs> now that you're approaching it from a consulting angle in terms of you know how? What's the initial, when people, I guess it's mainly people coming to you, but how open are people initially and, and how eager are they to do the right things? Well, good question, but uh, and a lot of questions. But I think uh, one thing is when, when you're working for one company, you have that company hat on. So you are always um, representing that corporation and you're only able to do so and so much to help other corporates to build up their programs because you cannot go into uh, details and it's really kind of scratching at the surface but having my own consulting business now is focusing on supplier diversity I can really dig deep into uh, corporates programs and help them uh, grow it with understanding their strategies and everything um, and I think that's the big difference of being employed by a corporate sharing knowledge about uh, supplier diversity or, or, or inclusive sourcing um, compared to having my own business now where I can really dig deep and help um, corporates to build their programs even from scratch and also, one thing is you, you always have your policies and, and uh, regulations and rules in the background from a corporation. So that's kind of the difference between having my own business where I set my own rules and I have my own policies and I help corporates to build their uh, policies and, and, um, and rules and guidelines around this topic. And, and when you're dealing with your customers, um... I imagine in the type of market you're off operating in, probably some of your business comes from referrals um, where you've worked with a company and they recommend you to somebody else or contacts you had through IBM. Is that is that how you're finding kind of um, some of your business is growing at the moment through that kind of activity? Uh, yeah, that's one side, but it's also a lot of uh, a lot of other things where we see right now in, in, in today's world that uh, ESG or how to source products and services for any core company 
um, is a topic on the table. And that's uh, something that many, many companies are looking in right now. If we think back to, um, or not even thinking back, it's, it's a current issue that we have supply chain issues, products can be delivered. And that's kind of a, um, a risk that many companies have because they kind of buy from uh, a couple of global suppliers rather than having their um, products and services purchases and supply base spread on different um, uh, suppliers. And that's also what supplier diversity does. It helps you to build a, a supply chain which is more diverse and more uh, spread across all regions and, and um, areas. So, so on the resilience side, that's extremely important. And particularly in light of what we've all been through around the world with COVID over the last uh, couple of years. And do you think that the impact of COVID, has that had a noticeable effect on companies and their appetite to, to approach um, ESG and diversity? Yeah, I think it's several several things that came together. So of course it's it's COVID, but we also had we also faced uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement in the U.S. Uh, in the last year and even before, and that has also created a lot of uh, awareness into looking into diversity and inclusion in the workplace and also a, in the supply chain, not just in the U.S. but also in Europe. So. I think that it, many factors actually came together um, that increased the, the interest and the um, importance of looking into a company's supply chain. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I think the point you made about Black Lives Matter is, um, is very relevant because during that period, it highlighted the fact that, you know, for a supplier to work with a company, you know, if they've got strong values, then they want the company that they're supplying to to have strong values as well and, and to represent their values and vice versa. If you're a large end client, you're dealing with suppliers and you've got strong values, you need that represented within your supply chain. And that's certainly important. And I think it ties into this wider concept that that companies really need to reflect broader society um, and real issues. And they can't just exist in a vacuum. Um, you know, they're certainly not going to do very well if they if they try to take that approach because it's just not accepting real life. Um, right. And I think that right. it's, it's certainly accelerated um, to the forefront um, for a lot of organisations now. Right. So diversity and inclusion is not just a topic that, that is uh, something that is in the workforce that you need to look at for your workforce, but it's a holistic um, approach that you need to take. You need to look at your clients, you need to take at your um, uh, communities where you you have your businesses and obviously uh, next to the workforce you also need to look at your supply chain. It's, it's still um, that department where you actually spend your money. So you you really want to make sure that you also look at, at your suppliers because it's, uh, it's also one of your um, uh, areas where you have a lot of investment yeah and it ties back to this uh the other this, this concept of cognitive diversity as well you've got different people from different backgrounds there's an overall net benefit um you get different ideas different ways of looking thing looking at things and you can achieve so much more than just being in a, a, a single viewpoint um so i think that is now seeing that being reflected in supply chain management is really interesting um, and we'll come on to looking at that from a services procurement point of view specifically. Um, but obviously with ESG, it's a, it's a broad, it's talking about broad issues. Um, I was reading an interesting article the other day about um, ESG within the insurance industry. And it was specifically relating to environmental impacts. So obviously from an insurance point of view, if you've got an increase in extreme weather events, you know, whether it's fires or floods or whatever it might be that has a direct impact on the insurance industry for example and it's just this whole thing of like business can't be divorced from the real world um but but just if you if you look at the this the whole diversity and esg angle when it comes to the supply chain how would you do you have a way of kind of simply defining that well i think you know the, the esg the, 
is is kind of spread into three pillars, right? It's the environmental, social, and governments. And supplier diversity is obviously part of the social social aspect, but it's all also everything. Because even if you look at uh, suppliers that have an environmental system and and um, or is sustainable and everything, you also want them to have a diverse workforce or look at diversity and inclusion. So it, it, it's all combinated, but also the, that diversity and inclusion part is kind of sitting in the social uh, pillar of the ESG, um, of EST. And it is not only uh, the supplier diversity aspect, but it also covers the local community support, um, which you, cover automatically with having a diverse supply base yeah and i guess if you if you look at it from a people-centric point of view so obviously there's the diversity within the organization and how they interact with their local communities and environment um and it's the people that make the business in a lot of cases isn't it really um so right. definitely you can see how that sits very centrally um within the whole conversation um so for a lot of people, I think the idea of addressing diversity in the workforce and environmental social go social governance concerns within an organisation, often people are looking inwardly at their business, their employees and their extended or their, their workforce effectively. So obviously what you're looking at here or what we're talking about here is specifically related to the supply chain. And... Um, what what is it that you see in terms of the value and the perception of that where people are looking at this externally rather than just internally right and i think that's a very good question because there are so many studies about having diversity and inclusion in the workforce and how it creates higher revenue and more innovation and everything but at the end of the day it's it's similar or it's mirroring what's happening in the supply chain if you have a diverse uh, supply base because um, it usually the diverse businesses are SMEs. So first of all, it helps um, make more business uh, with small and medium-sized businesses, which are 99% of the businesses in the EU. So that's one thing that we also have to keep in mind, which is very important because um, then the next one is having that innovation. It's small and medium-sized businesses, it's diverse businesses. They have different thinking, uh, more innovation. As we know from diverse teams, uh, usually when we talk about SMEs, it's flexibility. It's not the slow moving uh, global companies who take forever to take a decision, but it's, it's the smaller businesses which can take uh, quick decisions. Um, it's also, uh, <clears throat> supporting, as we said, the local communities, uh, creating jobs, um, paying taxes, local taxes, and so on. So there's a lot of um, a lot of advantages on that side as well. Um, there is a recent study that came out uh, from uh, MSD UK collaboration with uh, Equip. It's called Equip Procurement uh, Report. Right. And that has very interesting information um, about what it makes, uh, why an increasingly, increasingly diverse uh, Europe needs equality in procurement um, for ethnic minority entrepreneurs. This is just specifically focused on um, ethnic minority entrepreneurs, but it's also something uh, that can be applied for any other underrepresented group. It's very interesting that you bring that up, actually, because one of the things I wanted to talk to you about and get your opinion on was just what sort of differences you're seeing geographically. Um, and, you know, certainly from conversations I have with clients in the US, for example, you know, minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, that there seems to be much more going on in that space than, for example, there is in Europe. Would, is that correct? And, and why do you think there are the differences if there are? Yeah, well, it's, it has to do with uh, having some kind of regulations there. So if you want to work with the government in the U.S., you have to have some kind of uh, supplier diversity program or inclusive sourcing program that you need to report your data to the government. Uh, we don't really have that in, in Europe. Um, 
We do have it in some countries in non-US like South Africa after apartheid, they have uh, created a program called Triple BE. Yeah. Um, and that's also something which is uh, regulated and you have to do it. So, but if we look at Europe, there are many countries which don't even have a definition like for ethnic minorities where you can then create a, a, an organization to certify ethnic minority owned businesses, or you have issues with data privacy laws or GDPR, um, at, where you're not allowed to differentiate people from their uh, ethnicity, which is totally uh, correct, but it's then hard to actually find and define these, um, these um, ethnic minorities to bring them into uh, to, to create such a network of, of businesses where we can really look into um, them and, and support that, uh, that community. That's a really interesting point. I hadn't actually considered that. But in Europe, yeah, GDPR, so many benefits in so many ways around privacy. But that must make it incredibly difficult from a, from a diversity point of view. If, 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 um, you know, I'm sure there are ways to use the anonymity of data, but um, yeah, that's a that's a very very relevant point. And so, if you're dealing with, say, I don't know, a large US firm that also has operations in Europe, is that something that they just wouldn't even have to consider? Is that, does that cause difficulties for them when they look at Europe and, and the the element of GDPR? Yes, for sure, because every country in Europe, and we have around 50 countries, so they all have, of course, we have GDPR, uh, but they all have their own laws as well. So we really have to look at each country separately. And also, uh, if we look at women, for example, they're the same everywhere. So women are women if it's in, in, uh, in the UK or in Bulgaria or in Spain. But if we look at, for example, ethnic minorities, you cannot apply the same definition for an ethnic minority in the UK and in Bulgaria and in Spain, because it doesn't uh, reflect that um, the, the, the people from these countries and the ethnic minorities which are um, which which are there, right? So it's it's um, it's very difficult in terms of that. Uh, on the other hand, it's also uh, for example, if we look at LBGTIQ plus uh, owned businesses where we have just recently it was revoked, but there were LBGT plus free zones in Poland. So we have other difficulties um, or even uh, having it in, in some countries in Africa or in, in the Middle East where it's illegal to uh, to be gay or, or lesbian. So it's very difficult with these aspects and then also the, the definitions which have to be looked at very individually. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, I mean, if you look at the US, obviously there's, there's a lot of differences in depending on where you are in the US. You've got kind of like the devolved responsibility for local governance to a certain extent, but it's still one country, although okay, it's a very, very big country. Um, <laughs> But yeah, Europe's just so diverse in its makeup. Um, do you think so? That that does create hurdles. Um, and, and as you as you discussed there, different countries have different viewpoints on some of the issues that are within this. So that does create for particularly for global organisations, that does create quite a difficult. Um, it creates hurdles. It creates hurdles. But, yeah. So so Europe in some ways is more tricky than the US, for example. But do you think there's a difference in the motivation within companies in the US versus, for example, in Europe? Well, you know, it's always um, difficult to kind of um, uh, define the motivation if there is a regulation, if you have to do it, right? Um, compared to its, um, it's not, it, I mean, it's voluntary. And I think that's where the companies come into play, where you can really have your own policies within the company and make sure it's not a box ticking 
um, exercise for your employees. You, you need to educate, you need to um, share information about supplier diversity. What is it? Why does a company do it? And so on. So that's, I think, also the big difference that um, compared to having, having regulations from the government to having a program, but it's not really regulated. It doesn't have an impact on winning business or the revenue um, if you work with a diverse supplier. On the first side, of course, it has impact, um, as we also know from diverse teams, in a longer range, but not uh, at, the, at the very, very first side. And is that something that you're expecting to change um, in Europe in terms of the regulatory angle? Uh, and obviously, you know, if you look at the EU, for example, I guess you could have some sort of central regulation, but European countries are all very different. Um, what, what are your expectations on that side? Well, I think there are um, there's a lot of uh, talking going on in the background. I know there is uh, some some things going on in the UK with the government, but as we all know, with COVID and Brexit, there are other priorities right now. Um, I know that also in the EU, uh, it's one of the topics that is being discussed. Uh, because it's also related to, to um, equality uh, of the UN sustainable uh, sustainability goals, um, the uh, goal number five. So it's also related to that, where we want to make sure everyone is equal and uh, um, uh, included. Yeah, it's such an interesting, uh, interesting time for for these type of changes. Um, so if you look at it from Let's let's go back to the scenario within a large organization. So they are trying to ensure that they have a diverse and perhaps sustainable supply chain. Now, um, from a procurement side, if we break that out into the suppliers that are providing products or goods or materials versus the suppliers that are delivering services, um, what do you see as the differences there? And, and what do you see as the challenges in each of those areas? Well, I think it's it's not really a big difference because everyone wants to sell something. So they all have to have their, their strategy, how to win clients and how to uh, increase visibility and, and win business and so on. So, um, so I think uh, what I can recommend though for diverse businesses is look into the networks um, which are out there who uh, certify or have a network of that, that, that diverse uh, business um, definition and, um, and also look at companies who have strong supplier diversity program or, or live uh, supplier diversity in their company because that's where you can have that, uh, that uh, additional um, value add to the company where you say, hey, look, I, I provide whatever service or whatever product, and, and there are many others who do that as well, but we are a uh, diverse owned business. And at the end of the day, it's not about uh, positive discrimination. It's about uh, giving companies the um, chance to have or to create positive action. And, um, and it's not about giving advantages or anything. It's about inclusion and it's about um, <coughs> equality again. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and it makes sense. Um, I think one of the things that we certainly see um, from a services procurement angle is that um, the way that services suppliers are managed is generally... Um, different to the way that goods suppliers are managed in terms of the type of systems that are used, the type of transaction. It's more binary if you're buying things than if you're buying services and skills and knowledge. Um, and so generally organizations seem to have a much um, greater understanding of their goods and materials supply chain than they do of their services suppliers in the sense that I think it's easier for small, maybe diverse, definitely innovative businesses to kind of get lost on the services side where organizations just be met maybe very very aware of three or four very big prime suppliers but they might have a big long tail of, of supply chain that they don't really have that visibility of uh, we're certainly seeing very strong motivation from companies 
to understand that services procurement supply chain in more detail, partly because they need to know what they're spending and, and whether they're getting the results they need. But it absolutely ties into this side of it where they can really assess their supply chain and say, OK, we're relying on the big guys and, and they're telling us they're doing good things in these areas. But actually, that's in itself, in some ways, not very diverse. If we spread it out to different sizes of suppliers in different locations from different backgrounds, et cetera, um, that's, that's certainly something that, that we've seen. But also, um, I think if you look at the flow down, if, for example, your organization is dealing with um, um, a company that supplies some sort of materials for making a mobile phone, for example, then the implications for where that, what they buy and the uh, sustainability, environmental factors, um, the, the, the factors relating to local communities where they might have manufacturing operations and things like that are quite different to, for example, a services supplier because they might buy different things. Do, do you think, what, what, what do you think are the key points of note within that scenario? <laughs> well, first, uh, going back to the, the production or the products uh, businesses compared to the services businesses. And as I said before, I mean, if you have a niche product, of course you are in a better position than selling a service that is something that maybe you know 10 others others are selling so right. that's that's i think the big difference but if you have a product that's that 10 others are selling as well in the same size same shape and everything um you're in the same position as that services supplier so i think that's the big difference that you might more have more chance to have a niche product in the products um business than in the services business because there are only so and so many services right and and products are kind of unlimited so you can always have a, a new great invention um obviously also for services but that's kind of yeah uh over seenable can you say it like that yeah <laughs> uh, yeah I, I know what you mean i i i think there's definitely you know there's definitely opportunities where niche suppliers in i don't know cybersecurity blockchain ai areas that are new and are in demand where there are shortages of of it's not you know everyone can't do it you need to be right, very very right. specialized to do it so on the services side there are definitely you know scenarios where there are very specialist suppliers but right, you're right if you right. look at if you look at the breadth of product or material that could be supplied it's you know it's uh, like you say almost unlimited um but I think also like that, if we look at that second tier level, um, that that starts to get really interesting. I mean, that must be incredibly complicated when you're so. So when you were at IBM, you, you managed a full second tier scenario within. Was there a second tier scenario within that? Yeah. So I was leading the global second tier program, uh, which is a huge uh, <laughs> challenge, especially uh, talking about non-US regions and non-US countries. So in the US, it's pretty common that companies have a second tier program because uh, they want to make sure not just their first tier suppliers are running a uh, or diverse um, or run a uh, supplier diversity program. Let me go back. You want to make sure that not just uh, you have a supplier diversity program, but also your first tier suppliers have a supplier diversity program. So you ask your supplier to provide their diverse spend to you, which means that's your second tier diverse spend, which also means to your first tier supplier that their client, which is then the other side, right, is asking for that data. And uh, if you want to make sure that you can continue with that client and you can satisfy the, uh, the client, you want to provide that data to, to your client as tier one supplier. So that's a very, very interesting approach. And I think there are so many uh, opportunities there because you can really make sure that not just in the production, I totally see uh, that it's it's very common in the production, but also in the uh, as a services business, you are buying stuff. You, you oh, obviously you're not buying as much as a production supplier to produce something, 
but you also uh, have to run your business and you might buy training or marketing services or your facility management and you buy lots of other things to run your business. You buy all the, all the, all the pens and, and papers and everything to, that you have in your office um, and you, you buy presents for your clients and all that stuff. So it's, there are lots of, lots of opportunities, but obviously not as many as in a production environment where you have so many different suppliers just to make your product. Yeah, and, and how do you see the, one area of this that I find really interesting that I think sometimes feels like it's uh, not in the forefront for, 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 for most of the conversation is the effect on communities, on, on local communities and how that flows down. And if you look at that, taking it from a, a, a goods and materials supplier versus a services supplier, are there any differences there? Well, I think yes, uh, but it depends on where you have your production, right? So if you have, you are a production company and you have your production somewhere uh, offshore in another country, it might be different than if you had your production right where you have your your other offices um, where you can then really create jobs and wealth and and um, and support the local community with that. Um, and if you just have your offices to run the business and not to produce your products, you, you kind of are in a similar position as any services uh, business where you just need uh, the other things that, to run your business, but not produce something which is really with a factory or, or however you produce it <laughs> that you can, uh, you need to buy all the different ingredients to make your product. Yeah, so I guess on the on the kind of goods and materials side, there's potentially a much deeper, more entrenched impact on local communities that could be positive or it could be negative, um, depending on working conditions and and pay and and how you're affecting the environment in the place you might be extracting minerals or, or whatever it might be. And um, I think on the services side, the, there's definitely a huge potential positive impact around workforce and providing providing work. Um, I think with a lot of uh, services suppliers where it's knowledge and talent based and skills based, I, I, I tend to think of that as not necessarily being geographically bound um, in some ways. Like if you're extracting minerals from a mine, that's geographically bound to where the mine is. If you're bringing in talent, especially in today's world, you know, that could be remote talent. It could be talent all over the world. So um maybe a services supplier is is a bit more ephemeral they're not so tied to a location okay you might have a big consulting firm in a, in a city where they have a, a permanent supply base uh, uh, workforce that are a very big community there and it provides lots of jobs and wealth to that region um but it has the scope to reach much further than that um so that's that's a really interesting one and i think um where organizations are struggling with talent shortages that the in the workforce generally there is an increase in outsourcing um so outsourcing mm -hmm. to bring in the expertise to get the work done and also with with things the way the workforce landscape is changing with things like for example the, the rise of the gig economy um, and some of the regulations around whether somebody is classed as employed or self-employed as a kind of a contingent worker certainly very strict rules in the uk the Ger Germany, um, the US around this sort of thing. More stuff is shifting to, more work is shifting to outsourcing. Um, and I think in that way, it's critical that the little suppliers get noticed because that's where, that's where it's easier for people to go or people to get together to form these smaller organizations, um, particular specialists in particular areas. They might be quite small companies, but they might be very effective. Um, Whereas the opportunities that exist in those small companies might not exist for people in the very, very, very large organizations. Um, so I think from a, from a global workforce perspective and how that affects people's, people's job opportunities, not necessarily a specific area, um, I see that as, as, as pretty important on the, on the services side. Right, but that kind of goes back to diversity and inclusion in the workforce. So you wanna make sure even though if you 
outsource, you don't outsource 100%, you might outsource a small uh, or a, a certain percentage, but you also have your local people and you might have outsourcing in several different locations, which is is totally um, uh, something that, that almost every company does, right? It's, it's totally fair. Um, but I think even there, you need to make sure that you have that diversity and inclusion in the workforce still, even though you might not be local and have your employees, you know, every day in the office. We know how it is with, with COVID that most likely not everyone is going back to the office uh, like it was before. So uh, we have that, um, that situation that many, many people are working remotely and with that, you also need to make, make sure you have that diversity and inclusion feeling um, and making sure everyone is okay, uh, like you have if you were, um, if you were fa working face to face. And I think that's what you then also mirror to your supply chain. So if you have your offshore um, uh, factory that you wanna make sure if you buy something there, I want that diverse uh, supply base for, for that product that I buy for that offshore uh, factory. Okay, so so let's we're looking. We were previously looking at this from the view of a large corporate who are looking at their supply chain and addressing that and saying, okay, how do we ensure um, diversity and ESG um, good ESG standards within our supply chain? Very important side of it. If we flip that round the other way and look at it from a supplier's point of view. I think the point you've just brought up there is a really, really good point around, for example, diversity in services, um, particularly where, so the social side of it, you've got diversity within the workforce and inclusion within the workforce, but then you've also got the fact that it's not necessarily so location bound. Um, so what, um, how do you see, what, what advice would you give, and, and appreciate that you consult professionally so uh you know don't give everything <laughs> away but at a very very top level what are the kind of key things for a supplier to look at their own diversity and esg program particularly on the diversity side in, in this scenario what how how can they go about addressing that effectively you mean diversity and inclusion in their workforce or overall well overall because diversity and inclusion in their workforce is one thing but then there's the other factor you just talked about with regards to the impact on where they are, because it's quite hard to pin down services providers these days. You know, a lot of consulting firms and you know, everything's gone virtual. So it's almost like, well, where are they? Does that matter right. so much in that scenario? Yeah. Well, I think it, that's a very, very um, valid question and point. Um, I was just attending or, or participating in a panel discussion around um, uh, LGBTIQ in SMEs. And how how that is uh, perceived, and how also uh, lesbian women are um, choosing where they work. So they look at the diversity and inclusion um, <clears throat> policies or information of a uh, SME as well. So no no person of an underrepresented group wants to work for a company if it's big or small that has. Uh, no uh, inclusive um, uh, policy or or not policy but mindset right yeah. you want to you you want to work in a company where you can be totally yourself and you can share any information and don't have to hide that you might I don't know who you meet or where you're from or what you believe whatever so I think that's a very very interesting or, or important point for for any company that you need to have an inclusive um, environment to make sure you attract a, a diverse workforce that's where it starts yeah and in in that way it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy you know, if an organization has the right mindset, they're going to have the right policies and, and infrastructure in place, and they're going to communicate that effectively. And that's going to be attractive to a diverse range of people that could could work with them or work for them. Um, right. But let me add, maybe at the end of the day, if, you, if you're a big or small business, you want to work with the most um, innovative uh, and, and best for your business supplier. So, and that is... Uh, if, if you're big or small, um, is including 
any kind of uh, supplier for your RFP and make sure that you are looking at, at uh, a, a diversity of suppliers when you have your tenders and then uh, choose from there. It's, as I said before, it's not about positive discrimination. So you, you usually don't win a business just because you're diverse owned, but you win a business because you are included in that RFP and then you are just uh, providing great results. Yeah, it's, it's inclusion on so many levels, isn't it? So right. it's inclusion, inclusion within the the, the, the the main corporate, it's inclusion within the suppliers, and it's inclusion of the suppliers within the corporate's decision-making process. And I think, Correct. you know, from a, from a systems point of view, that's where we're seeing that the, the services procurement market is far less mature than the, the goods, procurement of goods and materials, for example. There's a lot more that's hidden, that gets lost, um, and where the supply chain just really isn't that visible on the services side. So I think I do think that is a, a big issue for organisations where, yes, they might have great policies internally, and yes, they might have expect good standards from the suppliers that they want to work with. But in terms of actually including them in the opportunities, I think that's something where there's a lot of work to be done because, firstly, it's a mindset change where people within organisations, particularly big corporates, will quite often go for the safe option, very large supplier, use them for lots of other stuff before, they might be a lot more expensive, they might not be very innovative, but we, we never get, you know, we never, I'm never going to get in trouble for hiring X um, or engaging that company. Um, whereas actually, there are, there are opportunities, there are, there are smaller suppliers that are putting their hands up saying, please pick me, you know, I bet they have maybe a great service, they may be go above and beyond, they're maybe cheaper, definitely going to be mm -hmm. more agile and, and, and maybe more innovative. Um, yeah. I think that's quite a challenge on that side. Right. It's, it's kind of going back to the cluster risk. And we all know we want to buy from suppliers that we know, right? And if you have been working with that business for for the past 10 plus years and they were okay, right? No, no issues. But um, it's also you know and then and then you start suddenly choose another uh supplier or you make this huge rfp where uh they might not be the best one and that's also not very uh a comfortable situation for a corporate to then share that information but if this is something that we have to mm, to do and and to uh just put on the table and that's why having some kind of uh, rules to include diverse businesses just in your tenders is already a huge game changer. It doesn't mean that you, you need to choose them at the end of the day, but it's an inclusion thing that, and, and also for you as a company to see, oh, there are others which are doing the same thing or which are doing similar things, but way more uh, whatever, more they were more flexible or they have other ideas that I never thought about so that's that's something that is um it's a it's really a big issue that you always go with the same suppliers because it works and you don't want to no transformation and no uh, no <laughs> no problems um but that's also what we what we've seen right now with the cluster risks that if you have so many things that you buy from one supplier that you might have an issue if they can't deliver yeah so so in that respect um would you say that the governance and regulatory side of it is, is particularly important when it comes to come to that part of it well i think you know having some kind of uh governance is important because it is um, something that you have to do at the end of the day. It's not just voluntary. And we all know how it is with voluntary things. You might have your, your, your procurement uh, folks are probably very motivated and to support supplier diversity or diversity and inclusion, but it's a time issue. So you have so many things you need to think about when you do a tender or an RFP. And, um, and if it's not something that is always there on that list, it, it gets forgotten. It's not it's not intentional, but it's something that is just whatever is not uh, required. Um, if you're under a, a certain time stress and and uh, have need to deliver, 
you just skip whatever is uh, whatever is not really required, and that's I think the biggest issue with ha not having um, rules or regulations. Yeah, it's the motivating factors, isn't it? It's the prioritisation. It's like going back to that thing about you know looking at envir environmental issues in the insurance sector. I can't remember the stats. I won't try try to, as I'll just get them wrong. But it was basically talking about the percentage increase in risk um, being this massive jump in in risk for life forever, um, and, and probably increasing over time. I mean, it's funny. I, I studied um, environmental biology at university a good few years ago, and um, you know, when I was at university, I was like, "Wow, this is going to be such a big change." You know, when I come out of university, this is going to be so important, and it's only just getting important now which you know it's which just you know seems seems amazing to me but you know the the business is about you know businesses are trying to be successful they're trying to make profit for their shareholders um but you know what they are part of the world and they have to think like that and i think that's the change where they have to think like that because if if the world gets messed up it's messed up for them as well and that has serious implications and if they're doing things that people don't like, people won't buy from them, people won't work for them, people won't supply to them, and then they'd have no business. So, um, you know, I think change is happening for all the right reasons, um, but it's it's uh, the, the regulatory side of it, I can totally see why that is just, um, just changes time. the game. Because people are busy, um, you know. And... Right, people are busy. And, um, and I think the... Um... <coughs> One of the things you also said uh, with the with the governmental, I mean, with the environmental um, stuff is that you have your um, just forgot what I was about to say. <laughs> well, do you know what the, the thing that always uh, strikes me about the environmental stuff is this, right? Unless you're Elon Musk and you can go and live on Mars, you can't get away from a bad environment. It doesn't matter how rich you are; you're stuck on the planet. And we've all got to live together on the planet. And uh, if we if we make a mess of it, it's going to affect everybody. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It's just going to affect the whole world. Um, right. So what I wanted to add, came back. <laughs> um, that's where I think a second tier program really comes into uh, play positively because you ask your suppliers to do something, no matter if it's environmental or diversity um, and we've seen, we seen it a lot with diversity and inclusion in the workforce in RFPs. So when, when, when you as a client respond to an RFP, you usually have to state, yes, we do have diversity and inclusion in our workforce. We do have some kind of program, whatever. Um, and there are also usually some uh, parts about environmental, uh, social, but not really about supplier diversity yet. <laughs> But I think that's very important that it will have an impact if you as company have such programs to win business at the end of the day. And that can that's what I think can really help to um, because if you ask your client, I mean, if you have to provide your your data to your client or if you ask your supplier to provide the data, it has a total different impact than if they would just be like internally, well, it would be nice to have a supplier diversity program, but nobody's asking for it. I mean, nobody from our clients. So I think that's very important that the more corporates who are jumping on the train to ask for diverse spend from their suppliers, the more suppliers, which are also usually uh, comp bigger companies are thinking about um setting up such programs so that's that's going to have a huge impact on the whole market effectively in a sense it's what we're basically talking about here is a flow down of responsibility right the responsibility being driven by the large corporates with their first tier suppliers who are then saying well we've got to get our house in order to be able to supply to this end client and therefore we need to make sure our suppliers have their house in order um, yeah. So in the US, they actually have. I think they go go down in the um, in a in a automobile um, area. I think they go down to fourth tier. So wow. first, second, third, fourth tier. <laughs> it's really 
and not end to end, but it's it's going down pretty far in the supply chain to make sure that it's really not that you don't have some somebody in between to cover that topic, but you really have it in your um, supply chain pretty far down. I wonder why that's particularly um, in the automotive sector. Is it is it driven by regulations in the automotive sector specifically, or is it just the fact that the automotive sector are, are maybe a bit ahead of the curve? Yeah, good question. And I really, to be honest, I really don't know, but I believe that it's because of the of the production. They, they buy so many products and that's why it's what we're talking about compared to a services company. It's not that they have several tiers, uh, but in the production, you just have uh, usually several tiers or more tiers than than in a services company. Yeah, because if you look at, I always think if you look at goods versus goods and materials versus services, the the services are very complex, whereas uh, the goods are, it's a thing, it's a red widget or it's a, um, a bag of sand or whatever it might be. It's a, it quite easily defined. In services, it's very difficult to define that. But the complexity on the goods and materials side comes in that supply chain. That's where that the, there's the real levels of complexity. And I guess if you look, if you think about a large automotive manufacturer in the US, the brand is so important. And even if it's not from a regulatory standpoint, if nobody likes nobody likes to think of a shiny product or a shiny brand, that actually where there's some pretty murky stuff and bad things happening down the line or impacts that by them being there and having their supply chain, that's causing. And okay, it might not be them doing it, but ultimately it's if, if it's their suppliers, then that's um, that's definitely not a good look. And, and I guess if, in an industry, no idea how, whether this is right or not, but if you look at automotive, maybe one of the large automotive manufacturers decided to pursue this strategy and if you get one of them doing it, then everybody's really got to do it to try and keep up because otherwise, you know, it's, it's just not going to look, it's, it's not going to be appealing to people who are potentially going to buy their cars. Right. So it's also, it's also uh, I think, a difference between uh, B2C companies or B2B companies, because if you're a B2C company and you do something wrong, it has a direct uh, impact on your revenue because people are like whatever if you if you put some um some <clears throat> wrong information on a on an advert whatever i don't want to mention anything i don't want to i, I remember that you, so. we, we, I, i'm trying to i can't remember the exactly the companies but there were certain things that i really noticed happening in the market around black lives matter where you know whether it was certain companies didn't take a stance on it or whether they took a stance that other people felt was unacceptable um but there yeah. was some real fundamental um business risk mm -hmm. involved in how they were treating their engagement with the world or in the cases of the people who weren't doing it right yeah. how they weren't taking any notice of that it can have a huge impact and there are companies who had such cases which then really turned around 360 degrees or 180 degrees and said, well, we need to do something here because we get a reputation issue. So there are companies which have really started and, and grown their supplier diversity programs because they had such a case. So that's um, obviously not the best, uh, the, <laughs> the best example, but it happens and you see what it can make if you uh what what can happen if if something like that um if, if you do something wrong publicly like if you have a wrong statement or especially b2c companies which have uh then a direct impact on 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 revenue and and clients buying your product or service yeah i find that side of it fascinating i think do, would you say that the growth and in importance for businesses of social media, for example, has had an impact on this? I think, well, oh, yeah, I think so, because it's so visible, right? Everyone is using social media and especially also younger people. Um, but I think it's different uh, audience 
So if you look at, uh, I don't know, grocery store, you might have different uh, clients than on social media. So if you have a product that is labeled, I don't know, uh, with wrong colors or a wrong statement, it might have a different uh, audience that is impacted or that, that takes it back than if you put something on social media which has a, a different uh, clientele. So I think that's that's the difference where where you post what who uh, who receives it or who sees it. Um, but yeah, I mean, social media has a, a huge impact on on everything. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting in the sense that companies are having some sort of um, social profile. You know, the the the, the personification. Of, of the company and having characteristics around that company that they obviously want to, you know, that they believe in or that they want to communicate or that they want to um, resonate with their, with their customer base or their audience. Um, because one of the things I was gonna ask you was kind of just going around my head earlier was just in terms of what you were talking about with, with for example, people looking for jobs and, and looking, seeking out companies and being more attracted to companies that have this inclusive mindset. And, and one of the things I was going to ask you was really how, how should they be communicating that? Um, but I guess it kind of ties into this side of it really, doesn't it? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think also, uh, also uh, businesses which are not selling to um, customers directly, which are B2B uh, companies, it's all about their statements their visibility are they do they have some kind of diversity and inclusion information on their web page um some kind of policy they might share or just other information that uh that helps to understand their feeling and their their uh how how their company works um but also i think it's uh it's important that no matter for the workforce or for your for the supply chain of that company to be engaged in local uh, networks. Um, so, as I said, with that uh, panel discussion I was in, um, uh, there were a, a representative from from local LBGT uh, IQ plus uh, networks that were uh, that that know exactly which companies are working with them and which one are engaged and which one are visible um, to, to that topic and, and totally tolerant. And I think it's the same with, with supplier diversity where you have to networks like WeConnect or ETLCC and MSD UK, where you can uh, get a member as a corporate and say, okay, look, we are supporting supplier diversity and we're not just, uh, yeah, we are really becoming a member of these organizations, so we have access to the databases and to the networks. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So, I want to kind of, I think we come to a good point to just kind of round things, round things up, round things up. A um, couple of quick questions for you before we finish. I found this conversation really fascinating. Um, so, bearing in mind. In some ways, there's not that much difference between what you need to do when you're looking at goods and material suppliers versus services suppliers. But if but when we look at the differences that do exist, with services suppliers being more people centric and maybe more spread out, um, maybe less of a less depth in the supply chain. Is there any particular advice that you would give to companies just at a very top level when they're trying to address diversity and ESG within their services supply chain specifically? You mean where they really only buy services? Yeah, so for example, if you look at some banks, for example, um, okay, they might spend lots of money on newspapers or uh, you know, uh, facilities management, for example, um, uh, or, or yeah, I don't know, certain, certain types of things that they will buy, computers, phones. Um, they will have a massive proportion of their spend that is on services. And, you know, it's just really looking at it in that specific scenario of where, even if it's a company that buys lots of materials and goods and lots of services, you yeah. know, are there any things that you think they need to particularly take into consideration when they're looking at those services suppliers? Well, I think, um, 
having having an open tender. Don't just focus on the on the few uh, suppliers you've been working with the past years. Um, don't. One of the things I also recommend, uh, and obviously it's it's uh, something that is not very <laughs> um, well received all the time is don't just put everything on price because sometimes um, there are cases where you have maybe a higher price, but what you get from that supplier is 10 times more that, than from a supplier that has a lower price. So I think that's very important to understand what are you, how much are you waiting what in your tender and um, yeah, and be be open for any any uh, any business and if they have a pitch and they don't deliver then they don't deliver but if they have a pitch and they deliver great then it might be something you need to look at yeah and ultimately if they have a pitch and they don't deliver you're probably not going to use them again um, but ultimately it comes down to having visibility of that supp that supply chain being open um, and um, yeah I think that's some very sound advice and uh, last question I have for you, um, it's always a bit of a difficult one because trying to look <laughs> forward in time, but I just wondered if you look at, say, the next six months and then the next, I don't know, 18 months, do you have any particular predictions of what you think we might see in this space um, in the kind of shorter term and then the longer term? Well, predictions or... Uh... Visions. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Wishes. Yes, go, go, go for aspirations. What would you like yeah. to see? What, if, if, being realistic. So in the next right. six months, what sort of things would you like to see happening moving forward? Well, I think um, I would love to see more corporates. First, talking about corporates. I mean, any SME is very, very welcome to do supplier diversity as well. But I think it's very much uh, driven by the global corporations, especially the U.S. corporations who have programs in the U.S. and now realize it would also be good to have something in, in their other parts of the world where they make business. So I think that's kind of my uh, expectation or aspiration for the next six months that are more especially uh, big companies rolling out their programs. Um, in Europe or non-US regions. Um, and then in the long term, uh, it would be great to have uh, some kind of laws and regulations governance on, on an EU level. Um, yeah, so that, that would be great because then it's just, a, 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 nobody's really questioning it. Nobody's really asking why and, and all that stuff. It's, it's all about, it's something that is just needed. We have to do it. Uh, and obviously, I would love to uh, have no such programs because <laughs> the world is all inclusive and all uh, everyone has the same uh, possibilities. But I, I, I think that's probably not going to happen. So that's why I, run, <laughs> I go for the other answer. Yeah, like you say, I think there's, there's, there's a definitely a long way to go. But the, the driving factors that are making this so important for, um, for people and for organisations around the world at the moment are very real um, and they make sense on every side of it. So I think it's a very exciting time um, for ESG and diversity within the business world as a whole. Um, yeah. Well, listen, that's been a fascinating conversation. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I think with your aspirations for the next six and 12 months, uh, six and 18 months, sorry. Um, yeah, I think they're very valid. And uh, yeah, I'm sure you'll be doing some great work to help make these things happen for the for the companies that you're working with. But um, thank you very much for your time, Andrea. Really appreciate it. And uh, Thank you so much, Johnny. It was, it was a great conversation and uh, very, very interesting. Thank you. Excellent stuff. Well, listen, let's stay in touch and maybe we can have a look at this uh, a bit further down the line and see how many of your uh, predictions and aspirations came true. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> Thank Excellent. you so much. <laughs> Listen, thanks a lot. Take care. I'll speak to you soon. You too. Thanks. Bye.